Attention everybody, this is Vitamina Interviews and we have quite a celebrity with us tonight. Uh, it's uh, Mr. Rich Curtis, how are you? I'm very good, meet, uh, glad to meet you. Me too. Um, so let's start with an interview with one of our usual questions, but it's also very important for a lot of people. Uh, your roots as a DJ, producer, how did you get to know electronic music? Uh, it was a, a bit of a random occasion. I was living with someone who liked to play records. Um, so he would, he would mostly play the same records mm -hmm. day after day, after day, after day. Uh, but prior to that, I was always into guitar based music. So heavy metal, um, pop music. Um, but it wasn't until I met that guy and lived with him that it sort of made sense to me about um, electronic music and the beats and mixing and um, trying to blend different tracks together, that sort of thing. And that was about 16 years ago now. Yeah. Was there any particular artist within electronic music that really got into you, that uh, really made you think, okay, I have to do this? Yeah, well, well uh, I guess the first idea that I had about um, electronic based music more than anything else. I mean, it wasn't dance music. It was Faithless and uh, Massive Attack. But that was more, that was before I was DJing, so, or wanting to DJ. The actual DJing side of it was more uh, because of Deep Dish and the, the Global Underground series. So that, that same housemate that I had, had a collection of, um, I think at that point they're up to number 23 or something of Global Underground. And I heard the Deep Dish one and that was what made it in my mind. I have to find tech house and progressive house and techno and those sort of genres. And then I went from there. Everybody loved that city, it's a double one. Uh, so I, I do too. And so I'm, I'm a big fan of also Global Underground and all of their history. Uh, now they are publishing it all on then through Mixcloud. So it's really good to, to have it all together in one place, lovely. Yeah. So after that decision that you made, what was then your first gig? Or how did you manage to get that first gig to say, okay? Uh, it was in my hometown in Brisbane, and it was uh, Open Decks, which is, I think that's the same term you use around the world. Basically, um, someone sets up a club, they try and bring people in, but usually it's up to the DJs to bring their friends. And it's just a, a list of people who have never played before, it's their first chance to go and try in front of a crowd and see how they go. And hopefully there's someone in the, in the crowd who promotes their own gigs. And that's what happened to me, I guess. Um, that first gig, someone saw me there and said, well, you're good enough. Why don't you come and play for us in a professional gig? And that was 2006. So yeah, it took, it took a few years, but that's, that's how it worked. Yeah. What's it like for any DJ or producer in Australia then to, you know, to break the boundary because basically it's an island <laughs> and it's a whole country it's a big one but it tends to be quite an ecosystem in there and you know you have the ocean all over <laughs> all, all around you so is it difficult from someone uh, from Australia then coming out of the country and going I don't know UK Europe you name it it sure is yeah uh, it may have changed since I started but it wasn't really my plan to do anything like I am now it just happened so um, the hardest part was trying to, to get the name out there and the, I, I decided pretty soon after I started that I had to create my own events and that meant a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of energy but it got my name onto posters, onto flyers and I also got to meet international DJs like Anand Catanio and um, Nick Warren and those sort of guys um, but it also meant I had to make my own music and without making your own music no one knows who you are outside of the country. Uh, so it wasn't until I did that that I, I started to meet people on Facebook and um, um, email, that sort of thing, where I was sending my music to them, they were sending their music to me. Uh, and that's how it basically got me overseas, was I met a few of the guys from Argentina. And they said, if you can come over here, if you can get yourself to our country, we'll find you plenty of gigs. Uh, so that's been my my philosophy ever since. So just save up some money, save up some spare vacation time and plan a tour. Speaking of tours, this is going to be your sixth tour uh, in South America. So and now within one month, you are visiting Chile, Brazil, Uruguay and Argentina. 
uh, then during these tours you must have acquired some taste for something of these countries. Um, anything in particular? Well, uh, I am a big fan of beer. Now, previously there hasn't been that much beer to be selecting from in Argentina and those sort of places, but um, in the last two years I've, I've noticed that the, the craft beer, the artisanal beer is, is picked up. Uh, also the food, obviously, um, I love the barbecue. So in all the different countries, there's some version of barbecue, which all my friends like to, to host when I'm in town. Um, but I guess it, it's just being able to play whatever music I want and knowing that the people will stay there until the end of the night, which is very rare in Australia. They have a very short attention span. They're there to meet girls and, you know, uh, or, or get into a fight. <laughs> um, but over here, it's more like they know what they're coming out for. They want to have a good time. They want to dance. They want to hear new music. And uh, they'll stay until they're told to go home, basically. So that's that's what I love about coming here. It's it's very free. I'd like to get then some attention on really an issue that uh, I've been reading for a couple of years now. Uh, other than this kind of attention uh, of your audience, maybe um, in Australia. Uh, then the clubbing scene in Australia is under really rough times and you know, hard times because, uh, you know, opening a bar or just a club, it's under heavy regulation and there has been lots of attempts to shut down all of, most of the clubs, small ones. So what's the situation now? Because even, for example, people like Mirik Milan were there to give conferences about a year ago on how the scene is treated and the 24 hours economy. So what, what's your take on that one? Well, we're, we're sort of uh, stuck with it now. Um, I think the only city in, in Australia that doesn't have that kind of restriction is Melbourne. Um, so yeah, they, they can stay open a lot later than the clubs anywhere else can. But Sydney has been hit the hardest. So the New South Wales government has put a lot of pressure on those, uh, on the venues, not just the bars, but everywhere, uh, uh, restaurants, clubs, the whole thing. And it hasn't been as bad in Brisbane, but they are all suffering. The clubs can't stay open very long. Um, they can only serve alcohol to a certain time. So it's harder for them to make money, harder for them to spend money on DJs. Um, so a lot of that culture, the clubbing culture has come down to the private promoters. So not the clubs. So they'll have a club there, but they'll, they'll say to the promoters, it's up to you to bring the DJ and pay for it. And they take the risk. So yeah, it's. There's always people out there who will take that risk, luckily, because without them, the scene would just be dead. Definitely rough times, but then I hope then that really gets better in the future, short future for everybody, because everyone deserves really good music all around the world. So, uh, especially, for example, I mean, Australia has been chosen like uh, people like Space uh, for their New Year's party. It's a tradition, so mm. you're the first country to receive the New Year and <laughs> You, you, you make it with style, so it, it's a good thing. Now, um, you have also been producing music and um, a few hours ago, it was published in your Facebook account that you are going then to manual music with your first uh, then track with analog uh, or synth, Howard. So, um, what was the evolution and what made you then take that decision, let's go Howard? Uh, the, the problem I've had is I get um, I wouldn't say bored, but I, I don't get motivated as much as I used to creating the music. So I have to, um, I have to either find some new tools or learn how to use the older tools a bit differently. Um, so recently, I, I bought a, a virus synthesizer. I, I, I suppose it's not traditionally analog, but it's more analog than anything I've ever used. So it counts. Um, and I just, I had it sitting there for many months. I had to force myself to learn how to use it. And eventually when I did, it opened up a whole new world. So I thought at that time, I've got a, I've got a new way of working now. And it's very inspirational. I mean, I could just sit there for hours and make noises. Whereas in the past, it was a, it was a bit more rigid, a bit more structured. Um, so I like having that, that sort of unknown aspect to it. Like you hit this button, what's going to happen? Um, but yeah, it's it's, just trying to find inspiration, I guess, because um, it's it's not easy after 10 years of making the same sort of music to think, how can I do this differently? Right. It's also the, the, the magic of hardware then 
to see what the box can do for you. Uh, luckily now you have a lot of buttons to save presets. <laughs> it was not an option before, but uh, as the machines evolve, really you have that kind of um, uh, save bank. <laughs> So it was nothing like that before in the past. Sometimes you had to take pictures of what you have done or it was gone forever. <clears throat> now, uh, what is then that still favorite piece of software you cannot let go? Uh, I love the Sound Toys plugins. So they're, they're all effects plugins um, that are crafted off very old machines and then twisted and, and mutated into other things. But basically delays and choruses and, and that sort of thing. But I, I always have at least one of those on every single channel doing something um, even if it's off I just want to have it there in case I think I need to twist this a little bit um, but no they're, they're one of the few that I go to all the time yeah great now uh, in two months there is going to be the hundred episode of resolutions which is your podcast uh, so that makes eight and a half years it's going to be quite a statement on your style and music selection so what has been the feedback uh, all through these years from the fans? It changes every time I, I shift the podcast to a different channel or a different station. Uh, so I started off in my bedroom on a live uh, dial-up connection, actually, for the first few. And that was, I don't know, 15, 20 people max. And at the time, everyone was getting that same sort of listener audience, unless you were a big DJ. Um, so then moving on to you know, places like Proton and Insomnia, FM, and now Frisky, it's, it's been a conscious decision every time to get more listeners, to get a better uh, reach, more numbers. Um, at the same time as trying to get more gigs, uh, basically feeding off each other. So the podcast helps me get the gigs, but the gigs gives me inspiration for what the podcast should be. Um, and I have no idea what is going to happen with the with number 100. Um, I'm thinking of doing all the tracks that have somehow, not all of them, but most of them that have inspired me through the years of the podcast. But then uh, maybe stuff that's even older, you know, classics. I, I don't know. I have to figure that out yet. Maybe it'll be uh, one of the sets that I've recorded on this tour if it's really special. Yeah. How is your selection process with... Um records, CDs, or digital downloads, whatever you're using now, uh, because that takes a lot of time, basically to find the music that in some way represents you, or then has some kind of, reflects kind of your soul. Uh, then, <laughs> is that, so how is that process for you between uh, the, the format that we used to have was just vinyls or CDs, then into digital? Because the experience that I get from other DJs, and, and mine as well, is it's much more difficult to remember what music is in a digital file that I've record. Oh, for sure. And I've never actually played a vinyl record. Um, and mainly because I'm a, a bit of an obsessive collector of things in my life. So I knew the first moment I, buy, I bought a record, I would be wasting a lot of money on many other thousands of records from that day onwards. So I've only ever played digital files. Um, but at the moment, yeah, I've, I've curated a list, I guess, of labels and artists that is always increasing every every time I log into Beatport or wherever. Uh, I get the promos sent through the various labels as well, I'm trying to catch some stuff off there. But um, I don't know; it's it's difficult to say. It's just a, a routine now, but it takes it does take up a lot of time. Uh, I don't know how many hours a week, but many hours, and mostly for not much reward. Maybe one podcast in a month, but occasionally one gig every two months or something. But uh, especially when I'm over in, in South America, I'll be on there almost every day looking for new things. Um, and <clears throat> I guess the the selection process since I've started touring overseas has been influenced by that. So I'm thinking ahead of what, will this sound good in Argentina or will this sound good in Chile or something? Not necessarily anywhere else, you know, home or in a podcast. It's just, oh, this is going to sound great in front of that crowd. They're going to love this. So yeah, it's it's a bit of a um, an odd situation to to try and categorise how it all works. Yeah. How do you balance travelling, family, uh, and such? <laughs> well, at this point in time, um, the family is yet to arrive. So, well, we're, we're talking about a family. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen there. I think. Um, Obviously, I have a day job, a normal job anyway, so I'm limited to how far I can travel and how often. Um, 
five, six weeks maximum per year. And I don't know, I think, yeah, that might change drastically with a child. It may not, I don't know, but we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm going to keep trying to come over here. Um, definitely going to, going to keep trying to make music at home and possibly start up my own record label. Um, I've got sort of something on the horizon with the record label, but it's not confirmed yet. But um, if I had to give up the touring, I'd go straight into record label, I think. Lovely. Now, uh, our final question, not to take more time because <laughs> everybody has a schedule. Um, your plans for the future and a message to all of your fans around the world and our audience. Well, I guess that ties in to the previous question. Yeah, the, the plan is to keep touring as much as I can. Um, 45 next year, so it's getting a little bit harder on my knees. Uh, <laughs> and possibly, now that I think about it, I actually I probably should get that record label underway because um, I've got a really good idea with, with a mate of mine in, in uh, Sydney. Uh, his name is Verv, V-R-V-E-E. -E. So him and I have got this great idea for the concept of how the label would work, but it's been a matter of time and money so far to get that underway. Um, but if that works, I think it'll be it'll be awesome. It'd be really good. But um, as far as everyone who listens and, and comes along with the gigs, just, I love it. I'm so proud to be able to deliver that experience and get the music out there. It makes, makes a big difference in my life and hopefully in theirs too. Wonderful. Your message to your fans? Uh, keep rocking. Keep rocking. I'll, I'll be coming out with, um, with more tours, more gigs, I hope, and uh, deliver that deliver that sound that everyone seems to love over here wonderful i have been listening to hit podcast all day long to get in you know in in tune and in sync you can't miss his parties so wherever you are and you see his name buy the ticket i can guarantee it's fun <laughs> thank you so much for here uh, for being here with us uh, once more <laughs> no problem thanks for having me it's been great You're welcome, people. Keep on listening to Vitamina DJ News. Thank you.